Oh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Carboon from Parks Victoria. So I'm just going to talk to you today briefly about Parks Victoria's active forest health program, and that is basically code for our natural values program uh, across the River Redgum Parks estate. Um, I'll just give you a very quick introduction to how the parks came to be, um, and then talk about the specific elements of our program. And I know we have a lot of researchers here and scientists, so as I go through this uh, presentation, please think about um, any research opportunities. We certainly welcome uh, discussions with any researchers um, to do any work in our parks. And we have a program set up to help facilitate research in our parks. Uh, I, I suppose it goes without saying that um, over time, government um, through the community started to appreciate the values of the River Red Gum Forests. And obviously their uh, natural values, cultural values, um, social and economic values, uh, and a whole range of values, and that primarily led to um, some discussions and lobbying, I suppose, for the area to be set aside as protected area. Um, I make a bit of a claim, which I'm happy to, uh, to talk about over dinner, that it's probably the last significantly sized ecosystem um, to be set aside as protected area in Victoria, but I'm happy uh, to debate that one. Uh, just a little bit of background, I think everybody's probably familiar with this, but in 2008, um, the Victorian Environment and Assessment Council produced a report looking in the River Red Gum Forest, uh, and that re report recommended that a lot of the area, which was primarily state forest, be set aside as national parks and other state parks and reserves. Um, following that report in 2008, the Labor government in 2010 actually proclaimed um, a whole range of parks, generally in alignment with what was in that report. Um, and, and subsequently led to the um, creation of Barma, Gunbower, Lower Goulburn River and Warby Range Ovens National Parks, plus the expansion of some of our other existing national parks and the creation and expansion of other parks and reserves. So it was very, uh, very significant and a very exciting time for us. Uh, this basically just shows um, the areas that have now been set aside as national parks. Um, all up was about 160,000 hectares of additional area. So quite significant, um, certainly very exciting, but also challenging. One thing about this park network, I suppose, is um, as you appreciate, it's very linear, so it throws up a lot of challenges. We have a lot of neighbours. Um, and also, there's a strong um, Indigenous and European cultural legacy with these parks, as we've touched on earlier. Um, so they're probably by no means natural. It's, it's been quite modified over time through different land uses. And we try and recognise that in the management of these areas. Uh, the outcomes that um, the government wanted to create from establishing these parks certainly centred around protecting the ancient river red gum forests. The government also recognised that um, water or environmental water is probably the key driver of the forest condition and that's a theme that certainly resonated here this morning. Um, it also certainly recognised the need to increase Indigenous community capacity in the management of these parks and um, go down the path of co-management with our traditional owners. And that's something that we're doing and something that we're very proud to be involved with. In very brief terms, um, the government allowed for recreation and tourism to continue, disperse camping, campfires all year round, and four-wheel drive horses and trail bike road riding on tracks. So that was similar to what happened under state forest, but it excluded other activities that generally happened when the areas were state forest and uh, that um, involved cattle grazing, timber harvesting, uh, hunting and dogs. The other key program was the Active Forest Health Program, so I'm just going to focus on that now briefly and I won't talk about uh, any of the other visitor services or recreational programs. When the parks were gazetted, the government committed to managing the River Red Gum Forests 
uh, under the Active Forest Health Program. And through that, it, uh, I suppose we recognise that the forests need to be actively managed to deal with a range of stresses and scenarios, be it drought, flood, or any other um, management scenario. So there was a real recognition that uh, we need to manage these forests, and that led to the creation of this program. When we think about the program in Parks Victoria, we divide it into these um, subheadings, I suppose, for want of a better word. Um, so we have an ecological thinning program, um, and I won't go into that in detail because my colleague Tim O'Kelly is going to talk about that next. Uh, we do have a environmental watering program, and I'll talk about that. Um, we recognise uh, potentially ecological fire as a driver or a tool to perhaps assist and manage the environment of the forest. Um, but as Keith alluded to earlier, there's probably not a lot known, and it's probably not the key aspect to manage those forests, whereas flooding seems to be much more important. Um, we certainly continue with our wheat and pest programs, and one of our big program is the management of horses in Barmer. Uh, at the time when the parks were gazetted, the government provided for domestic firewood collection from our parks. So that was new business for Parks Victoria. We, we generally hadn't provided domestic firewood from parks up until these parks were gazetted, and that's something that we're managing and trying to uh, grapple with. Um, there was also a grazing phase-out program, which I'll talk about, a science and research element and a management planning um, element as well. Okay, I'll, look, I'll just talk about a couple of these programs in a little bit more um, detail for interest. Um, but basically I'll just talk about the Bahama Hornets horses, and I did notice a few slides earlier had a few horses. Um, Look, generally, for us, it's probably fair to say before 2007, um, uh, the, there wasn't an active horse program. And around that time, due to the drought, there was a lot of community pressure on Parks Victoria and DSC at that stage to do something to manage the grazing impacts. And that led to the removal of cattle from the park. At the time, we also increased our feral pig control activities and we developed a draft feral horse management plan. Um, following that, the plan was released and we, we um, received about 70 submissions on what we should do with the horses. About half the people that um, put in submissions were keen to see the horses remain in the forest uh, and a lot of the people spoke about the horses having um, tourism value or heritage value. After that, the whole plan was put on hold, subject to the VIAC River Red Gum process. So we didn't want to preempt what was going to come in that VIAC process. And the other thing that I suppose came out of that for us is that we just didn't know a lot about the horse population in the park. So we set about doing a few steps to try and understand the horses further. Um, we engaged consultants to do a horse impact literature review, looking at uh, what literature um, had been undertaken in Australia and overseas on horse impacts and then make some inferences with regards to the Barmer environment. It's, it's probably fair to say there's been no specific studies uh, that I'm aware of at least or research on the horses in Barmer and the impacts that they're causing. There's certainly anecdotal evidence. Um, following that in 2010 the park was declared and the Active Forest Health Program uh, was um, established. Then for the first time in 2012 we undertook an aerial survey of the horses which I'll, I'll refer to soon and around at that time we formed a, a Barmer Horse Advisory Group co-chaired with the Audi Order um, to help guide and provide advice on how we should manage the horses that are currently in the park. That horse advisory group consists of local representatives who represent their community who have an interest in the horses and the area. Um, following that we've managed to define the objectives for the horses. We certainly realise that they cause impacts. Um, so one of the objectives is to manage the impacts of horses in the park to protect the river red gum ecosystem. Another objective um, is to recognise the social, cultural and heritage values of Barmer horses. 
Some of the com community are telling us that they value the horses for various reasons. Others tell us that, that they don't. But a lot of the work that's been done on horse programs, both in Australia and overseas, um, certainly highlights or stresses the need to understand why people value the horses. Um, with our horse survey, we trialled what was called a mark recapture technique, so that didn't uh, involve physically marking or capturing the horses, but it relies on using an aerial survey, um, in this case with a helicopter, and observing horses over subsequent days and trying to count or spot the individual same horse on subsequent days. Uh, the beauty of this technique is that it helps to ensure no double counting. So if a particular horse has a mark on it that's particular to that horse, and if you can see that across a couple of days, then you can be sure that um, that's one horse, if that makes sense. Um, for the first time, we're confident that there's about 144 horses in the forest, that's a minimum number, but we're, we're able to identify 144 horses across both days due to their markings. It was um, funny, once, when we presented that information to some of the community, one of the, uh, one of the community members said to me, I, I could have told you there are 144 horses in the park, but um, nevertheless, uh, for us, it was a, a really a step forward, I suppose, because we, we actually know, uh, you know what our minimum number is. Um, in saying that, it was pro problematic um, because a lot of the horses are very similar, um, so it was hard to determine with confidence um, how many numbers there might be or a maximum number. And as part of our program, we'll be looking to potentially review and consider other ways to understand the horses. This is just a uh, summary of that work over the two days. So the red horses were um, what was spotted on day one, and the pink horses indicate what was spotted on day two. So it just um, is a very rough distribution map, I suppose. Um, there's about 30,000 hectares of national park there, and you know we, we estimate perhaps around 250 horses spread across that area, most of them congregating to the west. Uh, this just very briefly outlines what we're planning to do now with regards to the program. We've established broad objectives. Um, we now realise we probably want to do a little bit more work before we um, go out to the community with a bit of a plan. One thing we're trying to understand further is horse impacts. So there's a lot of anecdotal in information that horses cause impacts. There's um, evidence obviously of pugging, there's evidence that they damage signs. Um, we have reports of stallions jumping fences and uh, harassing domestic mares. So a whole range of nuisance impacts. Um, so we're planning to um, do a bit more work to actually quantify and formally record some of those impacts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're also planning to engage a consultant to help us do some work on the heritage and social values of the horses. And whilst we're still working through that, uh, our thinking is that um, we will work with them and they will go off to certain members of the community that have a knowledge of the horses and talk to them and record their knowledge and their reasons why they value the horses. And we think that's pretty important for Parks Victoria because uh, we want to acknowledge that the, some of the community acknowledge the values of the horses and some of the information that comes out of that might help us with our park management programs, interpretation programs, um, and just, uh, you know, we might be able to use it as part of the whole park management process at Barmer. The other key thing for us is certainly horse welfare as well. Uh, that's certainly a key driver and a key consideration for us. Um, following that, we're just going to develop some fact sheets which will form the basis of a community consultation. We'll send that out and then we'll develop a strategy for managing the horses in the park. Okay, just very briefly, ecological thinning. Uh, when the parks were set aside in 2010, the government um, committed or made reference to an ecological thinning program, basically with the aim to examine the effectiveness of thinning um, to enhance river red gum forest health. Uh, now, I won't go into that much more at this stage because Tim's going to touch on that soon, but that's something, a big project that we've been working on 
with New South Wales. Uh, I mentioned environmental water earlier. Um, but we certainly recognise that water is the key driver of forest health for us. The, the interesting scenario is, I suppose, that Parks Victoria is not a key agency for water, so our philosophy is to work very hard with the agencies that manage water and environmental water so that we can influence and, uh, I suppose, learn how, how water is distributed and managed along the whole river system. Um, so PV contributes to many exercises that are led by other agencies which involve how environmental water is released and managed in the forest. I'll just show you a couple of examples there. Um, certainly the Living Murray program, which everybody is aware of, um, and for us at Tata Kilkine National Park and Mulcra Island and other areas, um, our involvement has been to assist and coordinate the um, construction of significant flow structures in the parks uh, to help manage environmental water. And these projects are some of the biggest um, projects in, in terms of capital infrastructure and expenditure in our parks, even though it's not our budget, so to speak. Um, another certainly um, important role for us is to participate in the various communities and committees that implement environmental watering, and we have a seat, for example, on the Barmamilua Icon Site Coordinating Committee, which um, focuses on the watering needs and priorities for Barma National Park. One minute. Okay, thank you, Keith. Um, just briefly talk about our grazing licence phase-out schedule. This has been an enormous success, this program. Um, I'll skip ahead here, but basically, as of September 2013, this year, um, grazing would have been phased out of all of our national parks, so this is uh, extremely significant. So after 150 years or so of grazing, we've managed to phase it out of all of our national parks and our other key parks. Um, it was done through assistance packages with landowners, um, and it's just been a uh, tremendous boost for that, for us. And that particular photo just shows a fence that's gone up to exclude grazing um, from Golden River National Park, I think, Andy. Warby we'll, we'll Islands. Thank you, Andrew. Um, the other probably key program is firewood. We, we, we're supplying about 8,000 to 10,000 cubic metres of firewood every year from our parks. Um, the challenge for us is to understand how to do that in terms of the impacts on the values of the parks and sustainability. And so we've started some work on this, but it's something that we need to do more work on. Uh, the one example, the one exception, I suppose, in terms of national parks is that we're also supplying firewood from Barma National Park uh, until June 2015, and that's residual logging material only. So when the park was gazetted, the government made a commitment, and it's in law that we provide firewood from Barma until June 2015. I just will just mention the science and research program. We have a program where we work with research institutions to, um, to, uh, and to form partnerships to further understand and promote research in our parks. So if anyone has any ideas, um, um, please come and see me or I'm welcome to discuss them. Uh, it's, it's a great program for us and it's something that's relatively new but uh, something that we're very excited about. And finally, um, we're hoping to bring all this together in a management plan over the next couple of years. Uh, and one focus of the plan will be certainly uh, think about defining the conservation objectives for the whole River Red Gum Parks, because it's probably not clear at this stage in terms of conservation outcomes, what do we want? Um, and then, you know, thinking about how we manage to meet those conservation objectives. The, the plan's going to be a landscape approach. And the proposal is it will take in uh, 97 parks and reserves at this stage. Okay, my take home message, this is from Isaac Osimiv, and I don't know if anybody knows him, but he was a, he wrote a lot of science fiction. Um, and I thought this was quite timely, uh, this message, that the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Um, and I would suggest that that probably resonates with a lot of us in many ways. And just want to acknowledge particular 
uh, Yorta Yorta and our partnership approach and all my colleagues from Park Victoria, and particularly those that are here that are helping me with the Active Forest Health Program. Okay, thank you.